Welcome to What's the First Pick, the CBS Sports NFL Draft Podcast here on CBS Sports Network. I'm Ryan Wilson, and that's our general manager, Rick Spielman, who has 30 years of NFL experience, including more than a decade as the Vikings GM. And Rick, we start every show with a peek at the old With the First Pick countdown board. How many days until the 2024 NFL Draft? Yeah, Ryan, I'm glad you asked me that as we get started for the show. And my role on the show is to announce how many days are left. And by that glorious board that we count down that you write every day before we get on the show, there are 22 days until the 2024 NFL Draft. Uh, for keen observers, that's just over three weeks, Rick, three weeks from tomorrow. So uh, that's the, it has crept upon us for sure. And with just over three weeks to the actual draft, there is a ton going on. And let's start with the old big news of the day. The Buffalo Bills have traded star wide receiver Stephon Diggs and a couple late round picks to the Houston Texans for a 2025 second rounder. And Rick, let's start here. You're the guy who drafted Diggs in the fifth round back in 2015, and you later traded him to the Bills. What kind of player are the Texans adding to an offense that starts, of course, with quarterback C.J. Stroud? Well, I think we have uh, an hour for the show, so let me start here. Uh, first of all, you know, you think you see everything in the NFL uh, with the trades and everything like that. To be honest with you, this took me back a little bit, uh, not back in time uh, when we were going through this same thing with Stefan uh, a few years ago. But just by the amount of dead money that they're going to have to eat, that are going to hit, that's going to hit against their cap, and the draft capital they got for Stefan Diggs, which wasn't much more, traded a couple of nickels on a back end, but didn't get a second round pick until 2025. And going into this draft, they only have a first round pick and a second round pick, and they don't have another pick in the top 100. So what are they getting? They're getting a very good football player, but he's coming towards the downside of his career. I think he's going to be 30 or 31 next year. Uh, there's no question about his competitiveness. I think the question comes into place is that that relationship with the locker room, that relationship uh, with the quarterback and the coaching staff, uh, did this have anything to do with them changing offensive coordinators midseason? When you watched him last year, okay, his production went down second half of the season and into the playoffs. So is it worth the amount of money they're playing for the production they got, whether that was his fault or not, whether that was a new scheme under Joe Brady, the offensive coordinator, those are all talks behind the scene. What I can tell you is how difficult these decisions are. And if you're technically giving away a Stefan Diggs for the value that they got and the cap, dead cap money that they're going to take, there are other underlying issues uh, behind closed doors that will probably never become public. And you kind of seen that a little bit with some of the disgruntledness on the sideline with Josh Allen, some of the rumblings during the last two off seasons. So he ends up in Houston. Houston Texans, if you look at what they've done this off season, I don't think they're just building to win the AFC South because I think from what everything they've done from Daniil Hunter, trade for Joe Mixon, now you add Stefan Diggs into the mix, they're not looking to win the AFC South. They're looking to go try to push the Kansas City Chiefs and try to win the AFC Conference and try to get to a Super Bowl. I think this happened a lot faster than I know the media thought, and maybe even them internally, because of the way C.J. Stroud played last year. So they're kind of accelerating their program and putting all their chips in to see if they can make it run at this thing next year as well. The one thing that I will guarantee you, the history of Stefan Diggs is a little bit, now you're going to a pattern of what his shelf life is for each organization. But now I know when he goes to Houston, you're going to get the best version of Stefan Diggs you can get because he's going to be motivated. He wants to prove a point. He's going to a good football team. And then we'll see what happens down the road. But I know for next year, you'll get a very good football player and you'll get the best Stefan Diggs has to give. So we'll talk about the, the Texans and what their team looks like in a moment. Let's start with Buffalo. Stefan Diggs is, in fact, 30 years old. But currently, as we look at their roster, Rick, uh, the only wide receiver on that roster who has caught a pass from Josh Allen Khalil Shakir, and he's currently listed as a starting wide receiver. They did get Curtis Samuel uh, in the offseason. 
Justin Shorter is listed as a starter at wide receiver. I don't know if he's a 17-game starter. Uh, if he is, more power to him. But I think if you're the Bills picking at number 28, in the recent mock drafts, I've had them taking an edge rusher because Stephon Dix was still on the roster. Chop Robinson or Darius Robinson made some sense there. But if you're there at 28, are you keeping your fingers crossed for a Brian Thomas Jr., which feels like a long shot? Are you settling for an A.D. Mitchell out of Texas? Or are you even thinking about maybe trading up? You do have those two second-round picks down in 2025 for maybe a, a Roma Dunze if he's there in the middle of the first round? Yeah, now, now uh, the one thing I hope you did your draft mock draft in oatmeal, etched it in oatmeal, because things are going to change between now and then anyway. So, yes, if I were you, I would go back to your little mock draft that you put on, and I would adjust it to maybe receiver is the biggest need for the Buffalo Bills going forward. So I don't know if they're going to have enough draft capital to move up to go get in a Dunze or one of the – you know, Marvin Harrison Jr., probably not, more than likely not, absolutely not. Or uh, <laughs> even Malik Neighbors, probably not, absolutely not, more than likely not. And I don't think they can go up and get Roma Dunze because they don't have that type of draft capital. So if they're kind of in a soft, if you want to call it rebuild mode or retool mode uh, because of Josh Allen and that contract that he has and all the players that they lost this year, uh, in free agency that they let go, then they're going to want as much draft capital as they have going forward into the future. So they'll figure some things out. There'll be guys still getting cut. You don't play an NFL football game. The last time I checked, it's I think it's sometime in September. So there's plenty of time to address the receiver position. They definitely are going to have to address it. I just can't see Brandon Bean going into the season with the receiving core they currently have on our roster. And I can probably guarantee you one thing, that's not what it's going to look like when they end up in training camp or when they end up opening the regular season. All right, we're going to go to break in a second, but before I do, I'm going to ask you a very simple question. I don't need a 45-minute answer. I need you to not GM me. I'm death trying to podium. pontificate all my thoughts on the show today. I'm full of knowledge today that I want to sh spill out there. No, I appreciate get it, that. Spiel, but sometimes Spielman, Spielman, Spiel, Spiel. Uh, okay, go ahead. Sometimes you get into GM <laughs> mode in front of the media as you laugh at your own jokes, and you just you just say a bunch of words. But I want a direct answer here. Uh, so here's what the Texans look like right now. We know how good Nico Collins was last year when CJ arrived. Tank Dell was a star when he was healthy. Now they have Stephon Diggs on defense, and they traded for Joe Mixon too as well. Excuse me. On defense, they've added Daniel Hunter, who you drafted, Danico Autry. Uh, they got Jeff Okuda, the former first-round pick in the secondary. Are the Houston Texans today, Rick Spielman, better than the Buffalo Bills on paper? Yes, I guarantee you that. Just on paper. We'll see how it plays out. But on paper, they have a better roster today than the Buffalo Bills do. All right. We know Stephon Diggs is now a member of the Texans, and we know he started his career in Minnesota. When we come back, we'll talk about some trip scenarios involving those Vikings, a team that most of us assume are looking for their next franchise QB, and we'll tackle that right after this. Welcome back to With the First Pick here on CBS Sports Network. So, Rick, let's talk about some draft trades, the teams that could be interested in making them, and how that might shake things up on draft night. So let's assume the top three teams, the Bears, the Commanders, and the Patriots, they're all going to stay put because they're taking quarterbacks. But after that, what do you think about this? All right, here's option one. Very interesting, my fine feathered friend. This is going <laughs> to be where the draft gets fun. So the Vikings, where you spent the last – Several decades, I believe, including the general manager for 10 plus years. Let's say they trade picks number 11 and number 23, and they may even have possibly have to trade a, a 2025 first rounder to, to sweeten the pot here. And they move up to number four, where the Cardinals currently sit. Minnesota would take quarterback J.J. McCarthy. He would be the fourth quarterback off the board. And the Cardinals, in this instance, we have them taking cornerback Quinion Mitchell to bolster the secondary. And then, fingers crossed, wide receiver Brian Thomas Jr. out of LSU last will pick 23. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, I think when Minnesota went and traded to get that second first round pick, they're setting themselves up to go get a quarterback. They don't have a choice. So hopefully Arizona is the team and it sounds like it could be JJ McCarthy. I know Ryan, when we were out there on the pro day tour, just talking to some people, I heard a lot of things that Minnesota had thought he had an excellent pro day up there and fits exactly 
what uh, Kevin O'Connell wants to do from an offensive standpoint. But they're not going to get it for just the first two round picks. They're going to have to throw in their first round pick in 2025 plus some more draft capital to do what they have to do to go up and get it. So if they go get him, I don't think he's the fourth overall best quarterback in this draft or best, or I shouldn't say best quarterback, best player in this draft. But if you have to have one, then you're going to overpay to get one. I think he's going to be a good pro, but I think they're going to overpay if they have to go up and get him. All right, you talk about overpaying. Let's talk about this quickly before I get to option two. And you've talked about this before. The first three teams, if they take quarterbacks, picks one, two, and three, all it's costing you is that first-round pick. Does it make sense, if you're the Vikings in this example, to give up an extra first-round pick and next year's first-round pick to get the fourth-best quarterback as he falls on the board? Does that make sense to you if you're desperate for a quarterback? Well, they don't have a choice. I mean, who else, who's <laughs> going to play quarterback for him right now? I mean, Sam Darnold, they signed, and he's a bridge or, you know, whatever you want to call, whatever term you want to use these guys, stopgap, bridge, uh, whole placeholder type quarterback. And I don't know what the quarterback draft class looks like last year, but it's not as strong as this year. And if they honestly believe this is the future and they go out and get him and he has a very successful career and gets him to the Super Bowl, who gives a rat's tail whether you – gave up uh, three first round picks or not. No one cares. But if it doesn't, then you're going to look back and say you gave up all that draft capital uh, for a guy that was not even not the fourth best quarterback, but not even the fourth best player coming out of this year's draft. But I don't know if they have any options or a choice. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, in the 49ers, we'd be talking about that Trey Lance trade if not for Mr. Irrelevant Brock Purdy. I don't know if there's a Brock Purdy in this draft class. Maybe the Vikings get him as well in the seventh round. But let's talk about option two here. Let's say, again, the Vikings trade those two picks, 11 and 23, and some future picks. You mentioned the 2025 first rounder probably is going to have to be on the board. And instead of going to number four, this time they go to number five, where the Chargers currently reside. New coach Jim Harbaugh, uh, old franchise quarterback Justin Herbert. You get him some help and right tackle J.C. Latham, and then you bolster that defense with Iowa cornerback, who can also probably play a little safety, Cooper DeGene. What do you think about this scenario here, Rick? Well, I wasn't involved in the staff meeting, apparently, that put the 23rd overall pick. Well, who the Chargers going to line up receiver? So before I go with <laughs> Cooper DeGene, and I know they knew that they need a corner as well. But, geez, they lost Mike Williams. I, I believe so. They traded Keenan Allen. Uh, so who's going to line up a receiver for him? I understand Harbaugh loves to run the ball, and I'm a huge fan of J.C. Latham. I think he is the best offensive tackle as a run blocker. When he puts his hands on you, he moves you now. I mean, people feel that, uh, but they have to get some other offensive weapons. So I don't agree with the corner going there, but if you and your little staff meeting that the scout in the corner was not involved with, to give my opinion, you guys decided to go with a corner, which is a little bit of a head scratcher for me, my fine feathered friend. We sent you out to get coffee when we had that conversation. All right, <laughs> let me throw this scenario at you. Let's say you pick 11, you're the Chargers, you've traded down, and you have the choice between Roma Dunze or J.C. Latham, and then you also pick 23 to fill in the need at that position that you don't take at 11. Who are you taking, Roma Dunze, wide receiver, or J.C. Latham? Ooh, now that one would have been an interesting conversation to be involved. What'd you guys do with me out of the room? <laughs> Apparently you took J.C. Uh, Latham. I would say We redid your contract. <laughs> in, in, in the Chargers situation and Jim Harbaugh and the offense he's going to run and the depth that they have at the receiver position in this year's draft, go get that tackle that's going to be a dominant run blocker because I'm going to be able to pick up a couple extra receivers. I don't think a Dunze will be there. That would be a really interesting conversation. I would have loved to have been part of it, but I wasn't. <laughs> but in my outside opinion, I'm going to go with the right offensive tackle. I do agree with that because they're going to want to run the ball, and he's the best run-blocking tackle in this draft. I get it. I get it. Roma Dunze is going to be hard to pass up, but I think you're right. He could be gone at the pick before at 10, where the Jets currently find themselves. But the Vikings aren't the only team in the middle of the first round looking for a quarterback, Rick. The Denver Broncos, they're in the same boat. What would it take for them to leapfrog Minnesota, trade up, and get their quarterback? We'll tell you that, Rick, right after this.
Welcome back to With the First Pick here on CBS Sports Network. All right, Rick, we've talked about the Vikings who pick at 11. Now let's look at the Broncos who are on the clock with a number 12 selection. And here is option one in terms of the trade-up scenario. What if the Broncos package that number 12 pick and say a player, and it's going to have to be a pretty special player to move up ahead of a of uh, Minnesota there. Someone like all-world cornerback Patrick Rattan Jr., one of the best cornerbacks in the NFL, and probably some future picks as well, to get up to number five. And here's what's the compensation going to be. The Chargers uh, currently sit at five. Denver's taking quarterback J.J. McCarthy. They need a quarterback. Sean Payton doesn't often work with rookie quarterbacks, but they desperately need one. And then you see there the Chargers, in addition to Sertan, who's going to be an immediate starter opposite Asante Samuel Jr., get J.C. Latham. Do you think this makes sense for Denver? Does it make sense for the Chargers? Both, neither. Where are you at on this one? Am I allowed to be honest? Absolutely. <laughs> Apparently, I wasn't in the room where you guys were going through these scenarios either. So, <laughs> in my humble uh, opinion, uh, if the Chargers received that type of trade value in Patrick Sertan in that, tr I would be jumping all over the table. Where do I sign up for that? I would pull a hamstring. In fact, I may go walk and carry Patrick Sertan because I need a corner so bad back to LA. So that is kind of fantasy land football, just to be honest with you, if I can be totally honest. But I could see, hey, Rick, you never know. Let me, know. Let I me never ask you this though. Let me ask you, so if it is fantasy land and you understand that the Vikings are picking ahead of you as the Broncos and have those two first rounders, what's the price of poker in order to allow you to leapfrog Minnesota? Because it's going to cost you a lot, right? Yeah, no. If you're going to do that, it's, it's going to cost you uh, your 12th overall, a first rounder. You don't have a second rounder because you gave it for Sean Payton. It's probably going to cost you another fifth rounder. It's going to cost you a first rounder in 2025, and it's going to cost you a third rounder in 2025. So not only you're going up and give that type of draft capital, but you have no more draft capital in the future. You lost another first round pick. You didn't have one last. When's the last time they had a first round pick with Russell Wilson and with the Sean Payton deals? So eventually they're going to have to use the draft to rebuild this roster, uh, you know, and they're going to get some cap relief down the road. I understand once they eat all the Russell Wilson contract that they have to eat. But uh, I could see them, I can't see them, but the only way without ruining all the draft capital in the future, maybe you do throw in a Patrick Sertain, uh, Sertan uh, to, to get that. Maybe that's the only way you can go. But if you would have told me that Tennessee was going to trade A.J. Brown to Philadelphia, I, I said there's a lot of swamp land down in Florida here that I would like to talk to you about potentially purchasing. But who knows? Like I said, the Diggs deal caught us off guard today. So nothing is bizarro land. To me, it's like a little fantasy land, but I would never doubt anything on what people are doing nowadays. All right, so let's say that um, you're the GM of the Chargers and you asked for Patrick Sertan and George Payton says no, but maybe Cortland Sutton instead. Does that make you feel a little better if you're the Broncos? Yeah, it makes me feel a little better. I don't have any receivers left either, so <laughs> then I'm going to have to address that. But I'd rather, <laughs> if I had to make a decision, <laughs> uh, I would probably be more willing to give up the receiver than definitely the corner because I can get some receivers, but how am I going to get them when I'm giving all my draft capital away? I got a solution, and this is ingenious. I can't believe I didn't think of this already. The quarterback for the 2024 Denver Broncos is the best player you faced in college. Remember who that was? Tony Romo? Sean Payton. Sean, Sean Payton. Payton. The yes. Other, the other yes. one. The other quarterback oh, yeah. from uh, Eastern <laughs> I, Illinois. I didn't I play against Tony Romo. I did play against uh, Sean Payton, and he was uh, East or Eastern Illinois. And we had a battle with him versus Southern Illinois. Uh, we played man coverage on him because he wasn't a good athlete, couldn't get outside the pocket, was an anticipatory thrower. Uh, okay. But uh, it went the Saluki way that day, and we went on to win the first uh, 1AA national championship, beating Clyde Simmons in Citadel at the Western Carolina Catamounts, I believe. That's right. It is Catamounts. Shout out Colorway, North uh, North Carolina. All right, let's do option two. 
uh, if the Denver Broncos aren't going to make Sean Payton their quarterback and have some plans here. Let's say they trade down instead. So they go from 12 to 24, and they're going to accumulate some picks, which is what they need as you tell the story here. And let's say the Dallas Cowboys trade up from 24 to 12. The Broncos get Michael Penix Jr., who I think is a first-round pick. I know some teams aren't quite on the first-round pick bandwagon with Michael Penix Jr. I'm perplexed by that, but it's a conversation for another time. And the Cowboys feel a huge need, Rick. They get Olaf Ashenu at number 12. He can slide into left tackle. Tyler Smith can stay at left guard. Teron Smith is now elsewhere. How does this trade, option two, how do you feel about this? I think this is a great trade uh, because the Cowboys and Jerry uh, Jones said they're all in. Well, they haven't done anything this offseason <laughs> to show that they're all, all in. This one shows that they're all in going to get a potential all-pro left tackle in Olu Fashanu. So I think this would be a great trade for Dallas. I think it'd be a great trade for Denver because they can accumulate more picks. And if you didn't know, Michael Penix Jr. knocked his pro day out of the ballpark. I think he ran in a four fours or low four, high four fours, low four fives. They said he had an outstanding pro day over there. So I think he, and I agree with you, is a legit first round pick. And then Olu Fashanu, I think, is one of the premier and maybe the best overall pass protector. I think he does need to get a little better as a run blocker. But he goes into Dallas and is a day one starter and is protecting the blind side of Dak Prescott. All right, so let's let's do a little math here. Uh, you and I have read some some stories where uh, Bo Nix met with Sean Payton and the Broncos. They don't have a second round pick, as you mentioned. Is there any conversation about maybe trading up into the second or keeping your fingers crossed in the third that a Bo Nix is there and addressing other needs if you trade down here from twelve to twenty four, for example? No, uh, because I don't think Bo Nix they'll be able to get to Bo Nix. If you sit there and they're going to wait there for the third round uh, to see if Bo Nix falls to the third, he'll be long gone before then. I don't know but if, if he goes in the, the first round, but uh, but how high you're going to have to give up a potential first round pick next year to maybe move up that far? Because usually the rule of thumb is you always add a year early uh, draft. So. If it's a third rounder this year, it's worth a second rounder next year. If it's a second rounder this year, it's worth a first rounder next year. So are you going to give up a first round pick and another pick for Bo Nix? So I think they're out of the Bo Nix market because he'll be long gone if they're trying to wait till the third round. So by moving back, I think the smartest thing for them is to get more draft capital. And if Michael Penix Jr. is there, just take him. But if he's not, then you have to make a decision on are you going to go with Bo Nix or not. And I think they will determine that as they go through all these pre-draft meetings and the process and the meeting with the uh, kids and everything like that. All right, I'll ask you one last thing before we take a break here. Uh, the two options we laid out, one's incredibly expensive. It costs you Patrick Sertan or, or Cortland Sutton, for example, but you get J.J. McCarthy, who I believe is your quarterback four. Is that correct? Yes. Or are you trading down, getting some extra draft picks, and getting your quarterback five in Michael Penix Jr.? Which one does uh, appeal to you most in terms of this team turning things around as quickly as possible in, in such a tough division in the AFC West? B. I take option B. Option A is okay. not very good. Option B is much better. And you feel the difference between that Penix one, and J.J.? That's the winner. <laughs> so the difference between J.J. and Penix isn't wide enough for you to feel good about giving up the farm to, to move up, correct? No. No, especially the way Penix has been going uh, through this whole pre-draft process. He is uh, a lot more, I think, liked than maybe you've heard out there. Some of the teams I've talked to, and especially the way he's been in meetings and how he ran at his pro day and how his medicals came out, I think he's going to be climbing rather than declining on draft boards. Awesome. That's great to hear because I think it makes a lot of sense because we always talk about the tape, and the tape was pretty impressive. Uh, with Michael Penix Jr., especially in 2023. So, Rick, the Raiders are the other obvious team that could be in the quarterback business, and they picked just behind the Vikings and the Broncos. So what would it take for them to move up eight, maybe even nine spots for a quarterback? Find out right after this. Welcome back to With the First Pick here on CBS Sports Network. All right, Rick, we've talked Vikings and Broncos, trade scenarios. Next up, the Raiders. Pick 13th overall. What do you think about this? Here's option one. 
The Raiders, they're going to have to trade up if they want a quarterback, and they give up pick 13, and that's like their second-round pick, pick 44. Uh, some future picks as well, almost certainly, given the conversations we've had previously, and maybe a player. And the first name I'll throw at you, Tyree Wilson, last year's first-round pick, the edge rusher. Let's say that's the package you send to go up to number four, and the Cardinals get Tele Fawaga, the right tackle at Oregon State. He's a day-one starter. You kick Paris Johnson Jr. over to the left side, and then uh, in, the, in the second round with that 44th pick, you get wide receiver Troy Franklin out of Oregon. How does this one hit you? Uh, I think that they're going to have to give up more than that. I think they're going to still have to give up. The additional picks, to me, would definitely be another first-round pick. And all these scenarios, because Minnesota, Denver, mm -hmm. Vegas are all in that same area, so you're going to figure it's going to be pretty much the same asking price. And I'm Arizona, and I'm number four overall. I'm asking for the moon because if someone is that desperate to go up and get, yeah, throw me Tyree Wilson and a first round pick and all that other stuff. What are they going to do? Say, no, I get stuck and I take a Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors. Sorry, I got a lot of other picks to go to that I can build this roster with. But I think that uh, if I'm Arizona, I'm working all three of these deals and whichever one is willing to pay. Uh, not that we're not friends, but this is also a business. And I've been in it where my friends uh, weren't my friends. They were doing the business and what's best for their organization. So uh, I would say that I would work all three of these deals all the way up through the draft. And whichever one's willing to, you'll have a pretty good sense knowing being in these situations, which one is legitimate and which one is going to overpay. Because why wouldn't you, if you're Monty sitting there, Austin Fort sitting there, they're going to overpay because I know you're coming up for a quarterback. I mean, you're not, you know, if I'm on a phone with you, uh, well, are you taking an offense or defensive guy if you come up to number four? Well, we're coming up to get a quarterback. That's what we're doing. It's not that hard to figure out. Even us media yahoos can figure out they're coming up to get a damn quarterback. So <laughs> I'm saying that work all three of these deals, see how many future first round or third round picks you can get for 25 as Monty continues to build this roster and take it from there. But all those scenarios we talked about, all that draft capital is going to be around the same except someone's going to rich the pot, if I could say it that way, uh, yeah. and uh, Kylie overpay just because they need a quarterback so bad. By the way, a few things more entertaining than watching Rick argue with himself about how high you're going to trade up and whether you're going to answer the phone, and then you answer the phone and you <laughs> yell at yourself. All right, I'm going to sweeten the pot for you, Rick. Instead of Tyree Wilson, I'll give you 1344, a 2025, second or first. We can talk about it, but I'll give you Devontae Adams as well, and that's what the Cardinals need. Ah, now, very interesting. That one would be, <laughs> yeah, that would grab my attention now, except I don't, you know. Uh, and, and because Kyler Murray isn't the same quarterback without D Hop or you know without the the weapons around him, so to add a Devonte Adams uh, onto that roster, all of a sudden that becomes a a pretty good. And Arizona needs receivers. I mean, they traded away, I believe, uh, Hollywood Brown, right? Or he went to uh, Kansas City. Uh, yep. Rondell Moore went to, I believe, Baltimore, or, or I can't remember where he went, but he also ended up somewhere else. Uh, maybe it was Carolina. I can't remember where Carolina, he ended up. I think that's right. Yeah. Atlanta. So he ended up down in Atlanta, and now you're adding in all that draft capital and uh, Mr. Adams. That would be uh, something that I would say, Mr. Wilson, we have a deal. Hang up and let's go. The problem of course, is if you're the Raiders and you get your quarterback in J.J. McCarthy, now he has no one to throw the ball to, and you put him behind the eight ball, and you're out of draft picks as well. So that's to the point that you were making previously about the Broncos. So these are all things that general managers have to sort out. Let me run option two by you here. Let's say the Raiders trade back to number 24, again with the Cowboys. The Cowboys are not going to take Olaf Ashenu. But let's say the Raiders here in this example – they're targeting a, a Bo Nick. So, again, you keep all your picks. You keep Devontae Adams. You have pick number 44 that you can bolster the secondary or the interior defensive line, whatever you choose if you're the Raiders and Antonio Pierce. 
And now you go with Bo Nix. I'll ask you, number one, are you okay with that in terms of Bo Nix being the guy at 24? And what's your plan for Bo Nix when you have Gardner Minshew and AOC, Aiden O'Connell also on the roster in terms of how soon you get him out there? Yeah, you don't have to get Bo Nix out there with Minshew and uh, Aiden O'Connell on the roster. And in order for Dallas to do that, they're going to give up, like I said, they're the first. Uh, but they're also going to have to give up a second, and they're going to have to give up a fifth as well. So this is the Dallas all-in theory that we heard about from Jerry Jones uh, during the uh, offseason to go get Olaf so, But this is a perfect scenario for Bo Nix if he is everything you want in a quarterback. There's mixed reviews on him out there. <clears throat> I have some mixed reviews on him, but if you think he can come in and run What's that? Did you done, Rick? Yeah, no, I you was getting talking? a check. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, so Bo Nix, uh, I, I thought that it was, that would be a great move because he doesn't have to play right away. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I don't want to put you on the spot with your Spielman Rolodex here, and I don't know what the comps we've had for, for Bo Nix, but I think the bottom line is, is this. He's gotten a ton better since transferring from Auburn. Uh, he had a really good season in 2022 for Oregon. I thought he might come out there and be a top 100 pick. Had another good year in 2023. We saw him at the Senior Bowl with Michael Penix Jr. Uh, he and Michael Penix Jr. were okay. They didn't uh, set, separate themselves in Mobile, but, but that's all right as well. And then, of course, he's done everything he's been asked to do in the pre-draft process, which I know – you like a lot. I, I think he has some starter upside. Uh, do you have a Spielman comp form in the old Rolodex, or you're not willing to go that far? Yeah, no, I have to go back and think of that. I think my kind of comp was a little bit Jimmy G like because he throws, you know, at Oregon, he threw a lot of screens, uh, a lot of RPO yeah. action. He's just got to learn how can he function in an NFL offense. And I think he's athletic enough. Jimmy G make enough plays with his legs. He fit in that San Francisco system very well uh, with a lot of the uh, timing and touch and timing throws uh, where he doesn't have to make a lot of decisions taking three, five, and seven-step drops in the pocket and trying to get through his progressions. I think that's the biggest thing on Bo Nix. Can he get through his progressions and can he run an NFL offense? Absolutely. All right, let me ask you this. So option one, the Raiders trade up. Maybe have to lose Devontae Adams. They get J.J. McCarthy. Option two, we just talked about. They stockpile a few picks when they trade down, but they settle on Bo Nix, if you want to call it settling. Which option gives them the best opportunity to compete in the AFC West, which includes a lot of dudes, especially in Kansas City with Patrick Mahomes and, of course, Justin Herbert uh, in L.A. and the Chargers? No option this year. So <laughs> it's a... <laughs> Uh, because it's a, you know, I think Gardner Minshew is going to be the starter. So whether they end up with who, whatever quarterback, I think they sign Gardner Minshew and sign him per, to a pretty significant contract to say it's almost like a marginal to just below marginal starter type contract. It's way more expensive, in my opinion, than just a backup. And then let whoever comes in learns. And then hopefully that person will eventually take over as the future franchise quarterback for the Raiders. Yeah, they have a lot of things to figure out, but it starts with the quarterback position. I think they got their coach, Antonio Pierce. The defense got a ton better last year uh, as the season progressed. But in that division, it's tough sledding if you don't have a QB. And we'll see what the Raiders decide to do. But we've given them two options here, and hopefully they listen to one of them, Rick. All right, we got one segment to go. When we come back, we'll look at a few other teams who might be in the trade-up, trade-down business, including the Bears, who currently have two first-round picks. We'll talk about that right after this. Welcome back to with the first pick here on CBS Sports Network. All right, Rick, let's look at the Chicago Bears. They're going to pick first overall, and we all assume they're going to take quarterback Caleb Williams, but they also have pick number nine. And let me throw this scenario at you because the Bears have four picks total, one, nine, and then not again until 75 and finally 122. What if they trade down from that ninth pick after they take Caleb Williams, move down to, say, pick 14 where the Saints currently reside, allows the Saints to come up and get Olaf Ashnew, a very popular name, uh, in today's show, the left tackle, he would replace Trevor Penning, who hasn't quite worked out at the left tackle position. And the Bears at pick 14 get extra picks. Now they have more than four first-round picks. And they get edge rusher Leatu Latu, who, if, if healthy, is one of the best players in this draft class. We've talked about him since the fall. 
How does this trade scenario strike you for both teams? I think it's really positive for the Bears because I understand, you know, everybody wants them to get another receiver or the pass rusher, whether that's Dallas Turner or whether that's Jared Verse. But you also only have four draft picks for this uh, draft class. So you're still building your roster. And they were very active and very proactive, I should say, uh, in the offseason with everything they did to improve their roster. But by trading back, accumulating some more picks, and getting Latu on your roster, which is a desperate need to go opposite of Montez Sweat, I think this would be a home run trade for the Chicago Bears. All right, so let's talk about all the things the Chicago Bears have done. And uh, it starts with Caleb, of course, when, when they draft him in, in three weeks on one day. And let's say this scenario plays out to get Layatu Latu. Let's say that the Saints get Olaf Ashton to start a left tackle. Which team wins more games? The Bears in the NFC North? Or the Saints and Derek Carr in the A in the NFC South, excuse me. Boy, you're asking some tough questions today that I have to really contemplate. Um, although I don't even know what that word means sometimes, but <laughs> <laughs> my wife tells me to contemplate some of my actions around the house here. So I was like, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm 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 going down the wrong path. <laughs> uh I think that uh, that's a tough one because I would say New Orleans because the NFC South was so weak last year, but the NFC South is pretty strong, especially what Atlanta did and Tampa getting Baker and Mike Evans back, and then Chicago. But the you know you're talking about the Bears, you're you're talking about the Packers, uh, two I think very tough divisions, um, but I would go probably. Betting on Caleb Williams, having a C.J. Stroud type year, I'm going to go with the Bears. Yeah, I think it all comes down to Caleb, of course. Shane Walters, the new offensive coordinator there. And I think if he hits, even if he's 70% of, of C.J., that makes things really interesting in, in that division that, of course, starts with the old Detroit Lions. Some guy named uh, Chris Fieldman works for the Lions, I think. All right, let me throw another trade scenario at you involving two other teams. Let's say the Rams, who have a first-round pick for the first time in the Sean McVay era, which is bonkers to think about. I think their previous first-round pick was Jared Goff right before Sean arrived. Let's say that the Rams at 19 trade up a few spots with the Seahawks, and the Seahawks love to move up and down the draft board. They currently sit at 16, and the Rams get Byron Murphy II, interior defensive lineman out of Texas, uh, in large part because he's the best defensive lineman in this class. He could be a top 10 talent by the time it's all said and done. And oh, by the way, some guy named Aaron Donald, who five years from now will be in the Hall of Fame, has retired. In return, Seahawks stay, uh, move down three spots. And fingers crossed, they get Jackson Powers Johnson one pick ahead of where the Steelers would probably love to take him, the interior offensive lineman out of Oregon. And they get a couple extra picks here, third rounder, sixth rounder. Do you like this for both teams? Does it favor one team more than the other? What do you think? No, I think this is an absolute win-win for both teams. And I think the Rams, because they're jumping the Cincinnati Bengals, who I think definitely need a defensive tackle after DJ Reed, uh, I believe, signed with the Detroit Lions. So they're in a win situation. I'm not saying he's going to be Aaron Donald, but he's the closest thing in this draft class to playing like an Aaron Donald uh, as far as defensive tackles go. Uh, but... Seattle needs some interior offensive line help. And let's say they're still right in front of, and when I put this scenario, they were still right in front of the Pittsburgh Steelers. So I still believe Pittsburgh really wants Jackson Powers Johnson. And I think if they don't take him, that they should reconsider because I think this guy has Pro Bowler written, written all over him. This solidifies Seattle's offensive line for years to come. And to get two impact players like that, on the interior offense and defensive line, I think is a win-win for both clubs. And the LA Rams, who effed all those picks a few years ago, now accumulated all of these picks and have enough draft capital to move up uh, to, to get a player like uh, Byron Murphy II. Yeah, the Rams have done things differently, and, and it's worked out. Uh, Puka Nakua, obviously, Toby Turner. Uh, Byron Young last year, they've done really well without having first-round picks, and this will be the first time to see how they do with that. And I've had the Steelers uh, not taking Jackson Powers Johnson, much to your dismay, and going with Amarius Mims, for example, right tackle of Georgia. I know you haven't been crazy about that, given that both players are there, in part because Jackson not Powers Johnson all. is so good. 
in part because you have a soft spot for Jackson, Jackson Powers Johnson, which I understand. Uh, we got a few minutes le left here, Rick, but why don't you tell us your, your draft story from back in your time with the Vikings where uh, Rick, who liked to trade his, uh, had been known to trade his mom for a seventh round pick, did some wheeling and dealing and had to be pulled <laughs> off the off the stage, I believe, to go pull off another trade. Is that right? Yeah, no, there was all, I can go through a thousand different scenarios in the draft room, but that one probably was the most bizarre. We had just taken Sharif Floyd and Xavier Rhodes. Uh, I went down to the press conference figure and the night was over, uh, starting to talk about those players, addressing the press, everybody high-fiving, hey, we got two first round picks, yada, 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 this and that. And then all of a sudden I see our PR director, Bob Hagan, darting onto the stage. I mean, almost pulled a hamstring and like said, start whispering in my ear. Like I was, you know, I was like, what the hell, you know, something happened. And then he told me what was going on. And then I look over to the corner of the room and I see George Payton standing there. And I said, uh Oh, what did you do? Were you a bad doggy? Why was down here? <laughs> and so <laughs> I told the media, listen, there may be another move. So you're not getting ready to go home yet. I went up to the draft room. We had New England on the phone, and we ended up moving up to go get a uh, trade Cordero for Cordero Patterson. Ended up getting three first round picks. Uh, and then I had to go back down and do the rest of the media press conference. But I've never in my mind thought I was done for the day and sat up there and just glowing about the picks we took and why we took them and how good they're going to be. Yet we had one. Uh, still in the hopper uh, that I didn't know about while I was on stage. But kudos to George Payton and Rob Brzezinski. Those guys were working their tails off with the phones, trying to make more trades while I was down there, and then came up and got it done with like three minutes. But I had to go up there because we were getting ready to go on the clock, or New England was. So you're, right. you've got a time frame. So it was not like a casual walk up to the draft room, and it was a pretty good hike. It was a full out sprint because they said you got about two minutes before they're on the clock. So by the time I got up there, they were on the clock and we were able to work out a trade and get the uh, get CP. It's like you sounds like you running through the airport in Atlanta trying to catch your connecting flight. That's how fast you were moving. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. And making a dive into the plane as the door was closing. Yes, I was. <laughs> So you've drafted Cordell Patterson, Percy Harvin, uh, in terms of guys that don't necessarily have uh, positions, but you like them as athletes. Cordell Patterson, of course, just signed with the Steelers. Uh, and it feels like players are, are maybe going to be more popular in that sense because uh, the the kickoff rules. But before we get yeah, out of here, kickoff rule. I'm going to ask you, uh, is there going to, I'm going to ask you, is there going to be anything that, any team that's going to surprise us in terms of trading up that we're not thinking about in terms of a quarterback, or is it going to be the usual suspects, Minnesota, Denver, Las Vegas, or is it something unexpected that we might think about? Oh, the only thing, the only thing that I would say is that we've done this and we did it with Seattle uh, is when we traded back up to get Teddy Bridgewater, no one's seen that coming. Ah. So if there is someone that falls and maybe they didn't get their quarterback, whether it was Denver, Vegas, or, uh, uh, then w they may make a move in the second round to try to go up and get a quarterback to get that fifth-year option. Yeah, so it feels like the Patriots maybe trade down from three. We'll see, and maybe trade back up in the first round. But I think if I'm the top three picks, I'm all taking quarterbacks, and then quarterback four is going to be wide open. By the way, Rick, that'll do it for us here with the first pick on CBS Sports Network. Thanks, as always, to my guy Rick Spillman. And remember, you can catch us wherever you get your podcast. Thanks for joining us. See you in three weeks of the draft.